Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a bonus pod of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. We are covering the 2021 FIDE World Championship. We will be coming at you heading into every rest day. We've got a great little episode for you. Here's the plan. We have two fun short interviews with friends of the pod who joined us from Dubai. Geert Vandervelt of Chessable. These days, he's actually the CEO of Chessable. He started out by making a free course about the Olympiad form, which you can hear in our prior interview. Uh, then he started managing content for them. And now uh, he is the CEO. So it was great to hear his perspective of what it's like to hang out in the Play Magnus Lounge in Dubai um, and uh, what what it's like on the ground there generally. And after that, you'll hear a short interview with Jonathan Korbla of Chess.com. Jonathan, also friend of the pod who's been on the show before. He's a trivia whiz, a speed chess um, specialist, a trash talking wizard and an all around entertaining guy. He had great stories to tell um, with his boots on the ground there in Dubai as well. I don't know about you guys, but for me, the FOMO is real. When I talk to these people, I'm like, man, I wish I was there. And um, it, it just seems like uh, so much fun. But before we get to these interviews, I wanted to give a quick rundown of what's happening in the match. Um, I've basically cleared my calendar for this event, and I've been feasting on all the amazing broadcasts and watching the press conferences, uh, just spending every minute kind of soaking in all the chess knowledge and entertainment that there's been from these three draws. So I'll try to synthesize what I've learned um, and give a quick rundown of the games for people who haven't been able to follow it as closely. Um, uh, so game one uh, was a pretty entertaining. Magnus showed amazing prep as Black. He attempted to play, mo- most likely was going for the Marshal against the Roy Lopez, but Nepo, as is popular, avoided the Marshal. Um, but Magnus had no trouble in the opening and even managed to push Nepomnichi a tad. But it always seemed like a draw was the most likely result, and that was what happened. Game two, uh, when Magnus had white, was epic. Um as predicted on this show, we saw a Catalan, um, and Magnus, uh, you know, he seemed like he got off some good prep, but he kind of quickly went awry. You guys might remember in my interview with Tal Proust Zimmerman, I read a quote from Jakob Agard where he meant, where Jakob mentioned that he felt that right out of the opening was often Magnus's weakest point, And that was certainly the script for this game. Magnus overlooked a move early in the transition to the middle game. And all of a sudden he went from having a, a having Jan on his back foot to um, needing to sack an exchange and a pawn in order to not be totally busted. At least that was Magnus's perspective and the engine tended to agree with him. So uh, it's not often you see a player with white down sort of three points and he wasn't checkmating Nepo. It was more of a positional compensation. Um, but Magnus, you know, he fought back and Nepo maybe played a little too cautiously. And eventually it was Magnus who was pressing a little as they settled for a draw. But certainly all three results seem possible in game two. And if you're only going to watch one video recap of one of these games, I would definitely recommend you queue up a Daniel King, Levy Rosman, or Ben Feingold recap of game two, or possibly all three. You know, again, there's so many insights to be learned. And that was one that, you know, if you just play through the moves quickly, you might not appreciate just how much drama was felt. I mean, the specter of Magnus losing with White so early in the match, uh, was looming large for a minute there. And of course, uh, he could have won as well. Now, game three was like a modern engine special. Um, Lots of opening prep, a shortest draw, and another Annie Marshall opening. Um, According to Lee Chess's Stockfish 14 neural network engine, it was the most accurate world championship game ever played. Magnus had a two average center pawn loss. Nepo had a three average center pawn loss. So they played nearly perfectly, which unfortunately a super accurate draw doesn't make for the most entertaining game, at least if you're just kind of glancing at the game, not uh, going through it deeply. Um, So that one wasn't quite the barden burner, but it's still important for sort of the subplots of the tournament because again, Magnus showed super strong prep, um, which 
is something to watch going forward, as I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, friend of the pod, Ty, Ty Pru Zimmerman, has already shared uh, his updated sort of model results. And not surprisingly, three draws don't change his model's assessment much. Um, Magnus is still about an 80% favorite. Um, as the number of game, if as they continue to draw, his statistical edge will diminish. That's also something that was echoed by Hikaru Nakamura, just more anecdotally or analytically on the chess.com broadcast. Hikaru mentioned that he thinks he really feels like Magnus uh, with two whites out of the next three. These are crucial games coming up, uh, resuming on Tuesday. Um, so I would say that the results most likely are going to fit into people's priors. If you thought Magnus was a big favorite, you're probably not disabused of that yet. If you were in the, but Nepo has a chance or better yet, Nepo's going to win camp. Then I also, you, you know, I also don't think you, you would have any reason to change your mind about that. So, uh, before we get to the interviews, I'll just share three observations I've heard from the many great commentators and from title player friends that I've been in communication with. And I tend to agree with these three observations, um, as we tentatively start to, uh, to look at the contours of this match. So observation number one is that Nepo came to play. Nepo does not seem overly nervous. Um, as we mentioned, the fact that Magnus has had great prep means that maybe Nepo has been out of books sooner, but he's navigated these positions quite well. Um, it, to my mind, he only made one significant mistake the, for those who saw the game in game two when he played C3 and gave a pawn back. Uh, that that probably uh, squirreled away any winning chances he had. Um, but overall, he's been, you know, matching Magnus blow for blow. And uh, there's no, you know, there hasn't been any indication that Magnus is just going to win handily from these games. Obviously, the script can change. But impressive showing by Nepo so far, um, despite maybe not uh, having showing as strong a prep, although there's always some conjecture involved in that. And number two is a related point. Magnus's prep has been on point. Um, Nepo's not getting much with white so far. Um, you know, Magnus has been playing the Marshall for forever. It's been a big part of his repertoire and he's come strong with it. And, you know, even if the, even if Nepo's showing a tiny edge, according to the engine, Magnus clearly has done his work on these positions and feels comfortable trying to neutralize them. So one thing I'll be watching uh, going forward is, you know, when Nepo does get his next white, does he take another crack with the Roy Lopez? Um, maybe try another line in the Marshall or really uh, sidestep to the Italian on move three or possibly even switch over to an English or something like that. Um, on the Magnus side of things, of course, he ventured the Catalan going for a sort of solid opening when he was white um, and got a pretty good position, got some prep off. But I mean, one key piece of information for Magnus now will be that uh, Nepo's probably not going to play the Grunfeld. So he could continue to probe the Catalan, being that he had a good opening, although it's lost some surprise value. But he also could go for a different sort of queen pawn opening, like playing knight c3 on move three, and then seeing what Nepo had in mind, whether it be a queen's gambit declined, a nimzo, um, and to probe Nepo from there. Uh, Fabiano's uh, coverage on chess.com has been amazing, and he's been mentioning that he feels like in their match, uh, Magnus, Magnus's uh, sort of overarching philosophy, especially as the match went on, was to probe with white and to just lock it down with just knowing your stuff. So more more prone to experiment with your repertoire with white. So uh, Tuesday's game will give us a lot of information about if Magnus is looking at or planning a narrow or wide repertoire. But again, the match is young. There's only three games played the last, so at least 11 to go. Um, so... Uh, and the number three uh, highlight or narrative is the return of the too many draws narrative. Um, you know, I understand for casual fans, it can seem strange that they're tying so much. But guess what? When you play, when the two best players in the world, as uh, Nepo said in the press conference today, it requires a mistake. Um, and these guys, they did make a couple mistakes in game two. That's why there were some potential fireworks. But in game one and game three, the, the mistakes were few and far between. But I do think if we can keep getting these, um, you know, n fairly... Um, rich opening positions. I do think sooner or later, someone will break through and there will be a victory or maybe, you know, 
who knows how many victories. But um, so those are sort of the broader contours of the match as far as uh, I've gathered. Again, I encourage you guys, if you have time to check out uh, so many of the great content creators on YouTube, I've been enjoying every broadcast, uh, just switching between them. I mean, Anish Giri and Judith Polgar have been great. Um, on, on Levitov Chess, uh, Svidler and often Kramnik um, and Moroshenko have been doing a great job. Uh, the Chess.com team has been great as well. So uh, with Fabiano, Robert Hess and Danny Wrench. So it's really an embarrassment of riches. I see a lot of people online. People definitely have their preferences. For me, I, I would be happy with, with any of them, honestly. It's, um, I know some super hardcore people are watching the replay of separate coverages. My, my kids won't allow that. But uh, other than that, I mean, it's just so fun to watch. So uh, we'll leave it there. We'll get to these interviews again. We'll be back with a regular episode of Perpetual Chess tomorrow. And then the next bonus pod will be out uh, prior to the next rest day. So please stay tuned for a quick break. And then we'll get to the interview with Geert Vandervelt of Chessable and then another break and we'll get to Jonathan Korbla and then on you go all ready for uh, the, the match to resume. So take care, everyone. And thanks for listening. And we are here with Geert Vandervelt, an old friend of the pod. He is joining us live from Dubai. He, you, you guys hopefully heard him in episode 161 when he was merely an employee of Chessable, not the CEO. Um, he's also he's a semi-retired rock star, chess enthusiast slash adult improver. He's also the VP of content at Play Magnus. He's a marathon runner, a dad, and uh, super grateful that he stayed up the whole way to 1 a.m., on Sunday, technically Monday in Dubai to join us and give us a quick rundown of what life has been like for him in Dubai and otherwise. So Gear, how are you? Yeah, good. A little bit tired, obviously. One, uh, it's late here um, and uh, we've been having uh, really long days um, just because um, the Chessable team is uh, is here producing some uh, additional content, which, which uh, we're going to share some soon. Uh, we're working with uh, Grandmaster Hans Niemann, who's um, uh, doubling as a kind of reporter, but also uh, he's doing these game recaps, like all the games. He's posting these videos to the Chessable World Championship course that we have with him. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot, just a lot going on. And then uh, obviously also uh, on the home front on Chessable, there are a lot of developments. And uh, since I did uh, recently uh, become the CEO for the company, um, yeah, there's a lot going on. So, um, yeah, but to Dubai is obviously a, a great, a great distraction, and the World Championship is really exciting, and to, and to get to experience it so up close, you know, I was just uh, today, for example, just sitting next to Henrik, and, and yesterday too, like just sitting there and talking to him about his son. And today I met Ingrid, um, Magnus's sister, and I got to talk to her for a while and ask her about her. All those, you know, they've, they've been to these world championships five times. This is their fifth time. So it's a really interesting from being a massive fan of chess and, you know, watching these world championships on a broadcast like Chess 24s and then sitting in the, you know, in the, uh, the team room and just talking to these people. Yeah, it's very special. Amazing. Yeah. And in the spirit of Chessable, we'll try to keep this interview uh, short and sweet so that you can get to bed. And honestly, yeah. what you describe in terms of um, sitting in the Chess 24 slash Play Magnus lounge, which I saw pictures of online and like sitting and kicking it with uh, Henrik Carlson and Magnus's other family members. Uh, that to me is kind of the primary focus of uh, of what I'm trying to provide here. Um, on Perpetual Chess because there's so many amazing game recaps such as GM Hans Neiman and Daniel Kings and the list goes on um, yeah. that that we want to just give people who are, you know, not in front of screens a feel of what it's like. So um, so what could you tell us? Like, how's let's start with this. How is Henrik's spirit? Like, does, you know, we're both dads, uh, Gear. We both know that like when our kid is engaged in like a competitive or important to them endeavor it seems like we get infinitely more nervous than they do do you feel like Henrik is at a stage in magnus's career where that's no longer the case or is he just sitting there like petrified in something like game two he was definitely sitting there really invested during game two um 
and keeping an eye on the game. You know, we have it on a big screen. Um, whatever is happening socially when he's speaking to people or whatever, he's watching the game. He's making sure that he knows what's going on. And, uh, you know, if he doesn't trust the engine analysis of the broadcast, he pulls up Sessa's supercomputer to check what's going on there. So he, he's, he knows to the, to the second uh, you know, it was funny, like uh, in yesterday's game, there was a moment where Magnus made this maneuver towards the end of the game, like where he went king g2, king h3, and kind of hid the king on h3. And uh, Henrik could say, oh yeah, it took Magnus only nine seconds to make that decision. So he's he knows, he's keeping track of the of it, you know. And, and, and uh, frankly, I've... I've been around him quite a few times now when um, when Magnus is playing, and I find it amazing that he can stay so relaxed and um, have these wonderful conversations with people who want his attention. The other day, there was a, a journalist there from the site. I think he spent about an hour talking to this this gentleman uh, while watching the game, and also you know making small talk with other people uh, and. Uh, but still, like it was a tense game. But uh, he he's fantastic at that. And and in fact, um, today when I was speaking to Magnus's sister, she mentioned uh, that it's much easier to go to the first half of a world championship match than the second, and that she's never actually visited the second half of a world championship match because it gets much more tense because every game starts to count. Whereas in the beginning. Much more people come by, it's more relaxed, it's more social, and the tension isn't, you know, super high yet because there's still this opportunity to turn things around if if, if it goes bad. That's true, but the aforementioned Cess, when it was showing like a minus 1.8 during game two, I mean, if Magnus had lost with Black, I feel like uh, things would have ratcheted up quickly. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. Um Yeah. But generally, you would say the mood is fairly convivial. It's like people checking in on the game, but also doing a lot of chatting when it's going on there in the, uh, I guess you could call it the Magnus Traveling Global Headquarters. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's actually really fun. Like the lounge is really nice. Um, and, uh, you know, when you get uh, characters like Jonathan Korblot checking in and... Uh, Shout out to Jonathan. Uh, his his had, movie uh, coming out for yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had Alejandro Ramirez there too. And we had uh, Hans Niemann. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, Play Magnus Group CFO, uh, Dimitri Snyder is an international master as well. So we have a, a decent amount of um, strong players in the room. Um, you know, it was, it was fascinating for me when... The, Alejandro was there, uh, and you know, not. Uh, I mean, he, he's worked with Caruana for years um, on his team, so it's really interesting to see how quickly he assesses these positions and then just explains why things don't work or work or what to, what to look for. Like he's so sharp, and they were it was fun. They were analyzing the position on the board. Uh, we had like we have a bunch of chess boards from House of Staunton. Shout out to House of Staunton. And um, uh, it was really nice. We were just like playing around with the pieces and going over some variations. And uh, Alejandro just had some variations on the board that actually happened in the game a little bit later. He was like, yeah, I think this is the critical line. And yeah, it was cool. Cool, cool to see how like they can, they can cut through the noise so quickly. Yeah, man, those guys are, are wizards. Now, I, I saw again mentioned online that for uh, spectators purchasing tickets, who I eventually, of course, I've talked to uh, – people there in a professional and media capacity so far, but I also aim to talk to a spectator or two before these bonus segments are done. Now I heard that this time, unlike some other world championships, they can get headphones where they can hear the official broadcast with uh, Vishyanand and Anna Muzichuk in their ears. Now, when you're chilling in, uh, in the um, play Magnus lounge, is there any broadcast that you can hear or are you left to rely on the expertise of people like I am Dimitri Schneider and Alejandro when he's around? Oh, we have the actually we have the live feed from uh, the Oslo Studio broadcast from um, oh, great. from so, and, and uh, so we and, and in fact we have the uh, feed that the the producer for the show uh, Arne Horvin is he's he's actually here in Dubai so uh, we get to see what he sees which is also fun because we get to see the like if there's a commercial break we get to see what the 
you know, what like Kaya and David and everybody right. are up to in between the breaks. So it's kind of funny for me because now I, this is the first time also for me to see what they do in between when the commercial break is running and like how they're like quickly, you know, shuffling things around or having a quick one-on-one about things and then they jump back in the broadcast. It's, it's cool. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, Korbla was regaling us with tales of just seeing like bumping into grandmasters left and right. And obviously in, in your professional capacity, that's becoming kind of old hat for you. But have you had any um, like highlights in a in a social from a social point of view gear? Mm, um, I met um, one of the people from Isklar, uh, which is the water brand that uh, uh, the Magnus always has, yeah. <laughs> the Magnus always had. And I actually had a really great conversation with him about um, branding. And, um, you know, like what, because it's kind of, you know, why would a water brand, you know, brand a, a, a chess grandmaster? And uh, so I was just asking him these questions because I was just really curious to learn more. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun conversation. So, so that was a good one. But, but I, maybe just a little bit more for selfish reasons also to just learn from somebody who has a lot of experience in that regard. Um, but uh, And I've met some folks in um, Magnus's inner circle who've been going to all of these different uh, world championships. I thought that was cool. Um, as far as like play, stronger players go and such, um, yeah, I ran into a bunch of familiar faces, but not... Uh, I, I was kind of hoping to bump into Kasparov because I know he's walking around and, he, and right. he's, show, he, he's showing up unannounced everywhere. But uh, I have not had the the, the good fortune to uh, to bump into him yet. Okay, yeah, and um, and Gear, I know you recently ran a marathon. Super inspiring to see. I will not, you know, I'm a I'm a like five mile and done runner. I will not be joining yeah. you in that uh, anytime soon. But. It makes me wonder, you know, today in the press conference, I believe it was the aforementioned Corbla I asked Magnus about his rest day sports. Um, yeah. when, when are you going to get to make your debut playing basketball or soccer with, uh, with Magnus? I already did. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, a few years ago, uh, played with them um, and um, <laughs> injured myself <laughs> like real badly. So I, I was, and actually I was asked to play tomorrow uh, to play in the football match because they're still looking for people. And I, I declined precisely because I'm uh, still training for, uh, for, for more running and um, I don't want to get injured again. And I definitely don't want to be responsible for, you know, getting all competitive and, you know, smashing Magnus in the face or something on accident, that would be the absolute worst possible <laughs> outcome. So I don't want to be that journalist that did that. So, yeah. yeah. It's like worse than playing basketball with Barack Obama or something, because like, it's not just that they're the, you know, they're the talent, but like, it's this particular moment, you know, if yeah. you're going to give Magnus a concussion, do it some other time, not, not during the world championship. Yeah, um, exa- exactly. So, um, and I know he goes 100% when he plays, I've seen him, he gets, he gets into it and he's actually a really good soccer player. So or, or football, whatever you, whatever. Depending on which country you're listening from. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, excellent. Well, Gear, as we said, we're not going to keep you long. It's super late. Last thing. So obviously CEO of Chessboy, I can't imagine how busy you are, but is there any particular project that, that you're excited for that listeners should be, should be looking forward to coming down the pike? From Chessable, you mean? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm super excited for us to uh, launch a uh, Chessable classroom kind of uh, uh, open so uh, to open it up to everybody it's been in this kind of half closed beta where we allow a lot of people in now and like more and more uh yeah but we really hope to do a lot more with that with that product and um to see you know what we can do with scholastics and with coaches and such it's su- such a beautiful you know product that's still in a developmental phase but um um, I've just seen so many happy faces in those classrooms with these teachers and the interaction is just great. So I, I really hope that next year we see more adoption of the product on a, on a bigger scale. And then hopefully it can just help a lot of people, you know, enjoy chess and, and be, have this kind of social gathering and learning experience. Uh, you know, the, especially in these times where again, COVID is kind of, 
messing things up in uh, in a lot of places. Um, I'm glad we built that that space now. Yeah, it's super cool. I got a, a, a tour of it. Yeah, and it's awesome. So definitely encourage people to uh, to make use of it. Um, all right, well, Gear, uh, we'll let you get some rest. Thanks so much for for joining us. And uh, yeah, relish every moment. I mean, there's you know a lot of people listening who would love to be in your shoes. So, uh, so I, I I realize that I'm really fortunate, and I count my blessings every day that I get to go and check out the chess and be, be in that environment. It's a really uh, unique experience. And um, yeah, and we should have mentioned at the top, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who, who are on Twitter will know that uh, David Cramley stepped down at CEO. Um, and that's, that's how you took over. But, uh, but just, just to tie up that loose end, um, David is still involved with the company, but yeah. no longer, no longer in daily operations. Is that right, Gear? Um, he's, he's definitely, he's always going to be involved. So he took a more strategic role just because he wanted to focus on some family time. You know, when you, when you have a company like Chessable that just grows rapidly within a really short amount of time and you spent years building that and then suddenly that thing accelerates and it becomes part of a larger group and that company's then listed publicly and all this stuff that just, it's just been so much so soon and uh i think he just wanted to take a step back and uh focus a little bit more on the family and and you know kind of just enjoy that with uh, all the additional pressure and all this stuff but he's he's going to be involved forever because just was his baby so like and i can't imagine him not you know like he's my biggest mentor so i can't imagine him not having him around Excellent. Yeah. And shout out to David as well. Inspiring to see what, uh, what you guys have built. Um, all right, gear. So thanks again. Um, and, uh, in, enjoy the festivities and the rest day and all that. Thank you. You too. Hey everyone, just a quick reminder that all of this bonus coverage would not be possible without the support of Blue Wire Podcast. Shout out to them. And of course, of the Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Chess supporters. So if you are enjoying this bonus podcast and you are in a financial situation uh, where it's doable, please consider supporting the podcast at perpetualchesspod.com slash donate. All right, on to interview number two with the inimitable Jonathan Korbla. And we are here and I am joined live from Dubai by an old friend and friend of the pod. You guys can hear a lot of his life story way back in the annals in episode 48. He is a USCF expert, a blitz specialist, often with a blitz rating on chess.com over 2,400. He's also equally or better known as a game show wizard. He's been on Jeopardy more recently. He's been uh, one of the stars of the show Masterminds with Ken Jennings, a true trivia whiz. And as I referred to him in our first interview, he has a Forrest Gump-like quality uh, when it comes to his wanderings in the chess world, not due to his intellect, which greatly outshines Forrest Gump, but due to his ubiquity, his ability to be everywhere and meet everyone. In our first interview, you'll, you can hear him talking about playing chess with like George Soros and Howard Stern and this guy, Magnus Carlsen, who it turns out he's rubbing elbows with again. But without further ado, let's welcome our guest from Dubai, Jonathan Korbla. What's up, Jonathan? Thank you so much, Ben. I'm going to remember that superlative qualified uh, description of a intellect that surpasses Forrest Gump. I'm going to try to write that on all, some business cards. Smarter <laughs> than Forrest Gump. <laughs> Got to set the bar super low and then just fly over it, Jonathan. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's the easiest way to stay happy is low expectations. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. Great. And I also forgot to mention that you you have been working on Chess, A Reflection of Us, a documentary that has been airing on Chess.com after their broadcast. Uh, we, of course, are recording this after game two. And Jonathan is the narrator combining his love and knowledge of chess and trivia as it's a horse historical perspective. So, John, you were telling me that's what brought you to Dubai? Yeah, it's a funny story, really. Um, so, you know, during the pandemic, I started to do a little bit of streaming and, um, you know, Danny Wrench has always been one of my big champions. I've known him for quite a long time and he wanted me to do just, you know, more higher profile things. And we were trying to figure out the best place that I fit in. And, you know, they kind of approached me with the project and it sounded interesting. And, 
you know, I still was kind of hemming and hawing about it, but, you know, Danny definitely gave me the hard line about it. And then, you know, when we sort of discussed kind of logistics of how it would be and uh, especially what the project would kind of coincide with being the world championship, I was like, well, all right, why not? And then I talked to my other friend, Ben, Ben Schechter, another longtime old Chestnut Schools buddy of ours. And he was like, you know, you should just go to Dubai and make it even better. And I asked Danny Wrench about it and he said, why not? And then here I am. So it was a, a process that started perhaps in like the end of August, September. And, you know, we were doing a lot of recording and a lot of fun doing the research, the writing, the recording. Awesome, man. I'm super jealous. And you did a great job, as I told you minutes before we were recording. It's great to hear your voice on it. And amazing that you you continued your ability to, to finagle your way into these amazing situations. Um, so I know that you've, you've been to previous world championships. I believe we discussed in our prior interview, you're, you're going with a VIP pass to the 2016 world championship in New York. Uh, how does this one compare, Jonathan? Well, this is a different pass I have. My pass says chess.com on it. I am accredited uh, member of the Expo 2020. So I get to kind of bypass all of the unwashed masses who are kind of <laughs> waiting on long lines to get into the, into the Expo. And uh, other than that, I don't actually have the uh, premier access that I kind of wish that I had because... Uh, you know, this is a little bit higher level of security, perhaps, than New York was. But um, I'm manning the chess.com booth. I am playing every single person that comes around and, you know, giving out prizes, promoting you know, chesskid.com and chess.com uh, along with uh, Mike and Sean. And, you know, kind of explaining things to the layman, helping out with other kind of production things and also doing these interstitial uh, segment bumps of trivia questions. So I'm keeping pretty busy, but not busy enough that you would call it work. Yeah, super fun. I saw you you posted a picture of you at the actual chessboard that Magnus and Nepo are playing. So I got to ask, Jonathan, did you manage to like sneak into one of those private rooms that they have and like steal a banana or something from them, steal one of their snacks, a granola bar? I, I've, I've been getting as many free meals as you would expect <laughs> Jonathan Corlin to get. I've been um, using the wide smile and uh, brilliant charm that the Savoir Faire, the style and grace, the uh -huh. easygoing demeanor that uh, has gotten me this far in life. Uh, I haven't actually been into the VIP yet, but it has kind of been Spartan in there. I can tell you that the VIP in New York City was sort of, jam-packed of you know finance type dudes and this one is well there's a lot of beautiful women in it so i feel like i am missing out so i think uh you know it's not too late i think i'm going to keep making some efforts to get get in there eventually sounds required yeah i know you've got like another week there and and john what could you say about uh dubai more generally like uh are you getting a chance to i know judith pogar mentioned on her broadcast there's like uh 192 countries with their own expos uh and, you know, who knows what else going on? Uh, what else can you say about your experience there? Well, the expo situation has been really fun. Um, I had some blisters on my feet because it is, I, I can't even tell you how many square, you know, how, the acreage of the place, but it's definitely at least several, a couple miles. And just from, you know, end to end, uh, some of the countries have really done it up and sort of put their best foot forward. Other countries kind of, I want to say mailed it in, but it's, you know, <laughs> visually compelling. Um, but beyond the expo, oh, by the way, the expo is, I think, going to be torn down within three months from now. So it's a, uh, a mark of, I suppose, sustainability and opportunity are the big kind of push points. But uh, the sustainability is going to be kind of hard sell because it's not really sustainable to build right. up these. <laughs> <laughs> very expensive structures and then quickly tear them down. Um, but as for the rest of Dubai, I've, I've enjoyed it. It's a lot of, it's, I'll say for me traveling, I do want to take in a little bit of flora and fauna, some nature, and there's absolutely zero nature in yeah. this entire country. It's just uh, a facade, uh, so a lot of artifice, a lot of buildings that are kind of, interchangeable. I got to see the world's uh, largest 
Ferris wheel, or one of the largest Ferris wheels, um, the Dubai Eye, and that was really fun. Um, traveled around the city a little bit, and uh, I did make a little trip down to Abu Dhabi as well, which is very fun. Uh, I got to see this uh, Grand Mosque, which was brilliant, as well as a water park where I almost like almost died in a water <laughs> park because it was I mean it was extremely fun but I think it was fun for the reason that they kind of did not optimize safety they just kind of cared about the thrills but yeah I, I've, I've enjoyed my trip so far I don't know how much I would recommend uh, a Las Vegas without gambling to be right. <laughs> but um, one cool aspect of the city is because they don't have kind of sinful outlets they offer every type of like turkish food georgian food like the ethnic food variety in this city and in terms of not only variety availability and price is probably unmatched anywhere in the world wow so what was the best meal you had there so far probably my next meal. I think I've had a lot of really good stuff. They have a lot of really great Indian food here too. It's uh, a lot of big Pakistani and uh, Filipino uh, population here. So there's cool opportunities on that end as well. Excellent. And Jonathan, I know you're, you're BFFs with Magnus, as you told us in your, your first interview years back. Yeah, me um, and Maggie go way back. <laughs> <laughs> we go back so, like... <laughs> You know, we play some ball together. We, we've done a lot of stuff in the past. He's he's definitely on his game right now. Like he's I've, I, every single time I've seen him, I've tried to be like, "Yo, my guy, <laughs> I was gonna ask ball. Yeah. And he's just he's he's like, uh, you know, he'll kind of give me a little nod, and he's like, "All right, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm here for business." But yeah. <laughs> his dad Henrik has been really uh, super happy to see me every single time I've passed Henrik. He's like, "Oh, John, come on!" So I've hung out with him in the. Uh, Chess 24 room, which is the immortal enemies of chess.com. So it's been really a, a fun little uh, experience of uh, the over enemy lines, perhaps, I, I should say. No, it's a small world where it's all good. In fact, I think you'll be yeah, preceded the, by a, uh, a Play Magnus guest. So uh, hopefully exactly. we can. Uh, Hopefully we exactly. can exactly no. I'm, uh, next next world championship, I might be working for chess or something <laughs> like that. And then I'm like, oh no, like I was in the chess.com room and everyone was like, what do you do, Corbla? And I was like, oh, I'm a soldier of fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and and you mentioned uh you mentioned you've seen a lot of other sort of grandmasters walking around. I mean, based on yeah. my social feeds, what who else have you bumped into? Uh, so Kasparov basically like passed by me like ships in the night and I didn't get to, uh, you know, get on his nerves again, as I usually do whenever <laughs> he sees me. Um, I've, you know, had a quick little exchange with Vishy Anand and wow. uh, yeah, there's a few others. Uh, I didn't really get to chat with anybody, but uh, yeah, it's luminaries. Amazing. Without a doubt. So Jonathan, I'm trying to keep these interviews short, even though it's like not my thing. I'm used to like these never ending sure. interviews, try, try to put people to sleep. But, but what, one last question for you. I mean, I know you've got like a week to go in this trip, but as of now, if you think ahead to 10 years from now and look back on this trip, what, what from this moment would you find most memorable? Wow. Well, I think the way in which people have been uh, you know, just super, really pleasant and giving a lot of just general attention to me in terms of, you know, they see me in the booth wearing the, the, the placard and I've, you know, posed for pictures with a lot of kids and, you know, not like necessarily autographs or anything like that, but just it's kind of a little mini kind of celebrity moment because of this uh, documentary situation I have going on. So, you know, there's there's been a lot of a lot of positive attention my way. So I think that's definitely kind of a, a little cherry on top of a overall fun trip that I've had. Sounds amazing, man. Well, please relish every moment. Um, definitely jealous. I, I, I'm jealous and I'm sure people listening are jealous as well, but it's great to get that color. And of course, people should check for the chess.com uh, documentary. Um, and I, yes, according plug, 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 reflection of us, yes, reflection uh, of us. you are going to catch it on chess.com or on the app on Twitch as well. Uh, it is a 15 segment, uh, documentary detailing all previous world championships. And, uh, yeah, it's really highly 
you know, created and well-made by the entire staff here. So I'm very proud of it. Excellent. Cool. So we'll check for that. And Mastermind, are you coming back to that? Is that uh, known? Any game shows we need to be checking for you on? uh, We filmed three seasons of Masterminds and uh, we kind of finished our last taping back in February that aired uh, all the way up until the spring. We're on a little hiatus because of Ken Jennings and his schedule being so jam-packed with hosting Jeopardy and uh, you know, being on the chase, but, you know, I don't really want to, like, I've signed a few things about something that's okay. going on, perhaps on ABC in the fall that wow, could be amazing. featuring your boy, Jonathan Korbla. So, uh, you know, I'm moving my way up from, uh, you know, Twitch to uh, basic cable to broadcast television. So that's the uh, knock on wood. So let's cross you're our just, fingers for you're that. Just too, your star is too bright for Twitch. Uh, listen uh, you, you'll see me there who knows, who knows? <laughs> excellent all right jonathan well fun as i expected you always deliver it's always entertaining please uh continue to enjoy your travels and we will check for your documentary on chess.com much love and and definitely everyone keep watch, listening to uh, perpetual chess you do you do it better than anyone else sir oh, better than thank, anyone else thank you appreciate it Thank you.